Welcome, everyone. Thank you all so, so much for coming out tonight. My name is Amali. I'm the events coordinator at Books Are Magic, which, if you don't know, is a really wonderful independent bookstore <coughs> just a few blocks away from here. Um, we're so excited to get to host this event tonight, and before we get started, I just have a few housekeeping notes to get out of the way. First off, of course, I want to thank Invisible Dog for allowing us to use their beautiful space for this event tonight. If you need a restroom at any point, they are through the doors directly behind you. Um, and we do ask that you keep your masks on and covering both your mouth and nose throughout the duration of this event. Um, at the end of the discussion, we will be doing a hand-raised audience Q&A, so please start thinking of questions to ask. And I know many of you picked up a book when you purchased your ticket, but we do have just a few additional copies available for purchase tonight. Um, and if you're turning, tuning in virtually on the YouTube live stream, we'd love to encourage you to buy a copy online using the link in the live stream description. So with all that in mind, it is my great, great privilege to introduce this incredible panel that we have here with us tonight. We are joined by Sonia Guignan-Saka and several of the contributors featured in this fantastic collection, Dangeli Rodriguez, Jesus Baez, Chang Li, and Emilia Fialo. <laughs> and trying to come up with an introduction for somewhere we are human, I mean, I just couldn't find the right words to properly describe how stunning this collection is. Really, it is pure art in every way, in the prose and the poetry, in the imagery and the illustrations, and in the intention and the message, touching on themes of race, gender, sexuality, class, family and parenthood, personal and political identity, this anthology is so incredibly unique and honestly just so vitally important to read these days. Um, that's what I just really want to stress in this introduction is read the book, reflect on it, read it again, and in the meantime, give all your attention and gratitude to the writers who we have with us today. Sonia Inyansaka is an international multidisciplinary artist, cultural strategist, and activist. They write narrative poems and essays on migration, queerness, climate change, and nostalgia, often co collaborating with filmmakers and visual artists. Sonia has been featured by Pen America, Interview Magazine, Diva Magazine UK, NBC, and PBS, and was named one of the 13 coolest queers on the internet by Teen Vogue. <laughs> <laughs> their debut chapbook, Nostalgia and Borders, in 2016. Sonia is launching House of Alegria, a publishing house for queer, trans, non-binary, and migrant undocumented writers. Next to Sonia, we have Dangeli, who is a Dominican Bronx-raised community organizer, writer, and spoken word performer. She has been featured by the Bronx Museum of the Arts, the San Francisco Museum of the African Diaspora, People in Espanol Magazine, and others. In December of 2019, she self-published her, per her first collection of poetry, uh, Periodicos de Ayer, A Lover's Archive. Dangeli is the co-founder and co-host of Loose Accents, a Latinx podcast that highlights the immigrant experiences of the East and West Coasts. Next to her, we have Jesus Baez, who is a queer Mexican immigrant educator, storyteller, and performer based in Austin, Texas. Jesus holds a master's degree in communication studies from California State University, Long Beach, with a focus on performance and qualitative research methods. Their work has been published in the Shea Journal, the Texas Review, and the New Republic. And we have Chang Li, uh, Chang Li, Li, Chang Li, Chang Li, sorry, or Chi Li, <laughs> who is a Vietnamese American artist. She has a fondness for words, both in poetry and in acting. She loves all work by Mary Oliver. On occasion, she'll bask in a cup of bad coffee. Currently, she is working on her first poetry collection. Her poetry collection. And last but not least, we have Amelia Fialo, 
who is an English language arts high school teacher and continues to support undocumented students and immigrant families across NYC public schools. David and Amelia are celebrating three years of marriage, and they are currently in the process of adopting a dog. She has not seen her parents since COVID hit, but occasionally visits her sister in Brooklyn. Okay, that's enough for me. Yeah, uh, so just a quick note, we're gonna uh, just give you a taste of some of the things that are part of this book. Uh, we do ask if you are tweeting or Facebooking or Instagramming to use hashtag somewhere we are human. Um, and it takes a lot for us artists and cultural workers to share our work. So if you can, um, please join by applauding, snapping, you doing your mm, you know, whatever works. Um, let's show some love to our amazing contributors. And Jesus, um, can you do that? The honor. Um, I'm going to read a piece called You Find Home, Then You Run. Um, yeah, I think by the end of last week, I was hearing a lot of tricklings of people being like, I'm leaving the U.S. And I was like, work, where, where are you going to go? <laughs> um, you find home, then you run. A poet says she sees music in my work. You build this speed, this motion, then you stop, then you go. It's like you find home, then you run. It's like that. Like I find myself next to you, want to leave you in the middle of the night, or like my mother loves me, but I can't fix her sick, so I get on a bus anyway. Or like every man that has ever wanted me into a harbor, then the land comes undone. Or like when I laid my body atop the first boy I ever loved, until the janitor walked in, the first thing I did was run. Or like the way I saw them call home, but all I can talk about is my family. Is it like that? A desert child, I want to look at water, long for a Pacific, pouring itself into the Rio Grande and not mourn anything. Is it like flowers? Is it like roses? Is it remembering every dirt like a limb? My own errant right leg, its left twin longing to root, or a house I once lived in, a home, then you run. Like when Hector, my fifth grade friend, the well-made promise of safe walks home, my trailer park hero, beautiful then, and I was a round, pigeon-shaped thing. He, he, God, he was so fucking beautiful. Later, when he had lupus, I would have turned myself into bone marrow to live inside him, hold his body upright. Is it like that? That I love my friends because they are my only country, the only nation I'll ever know. Mexico wanted me dead. This place wants me jailed, then dead. Like so many poets long for the desert, the cactus, the moon, like they have a home there. I was born in the dirt, raised by a choir of factories. The lungs inside each factory were all made of dead women, women mourning their dead who would eventually die. How do I write a beautiful sonnet about the fact that a maquiladora made me? My mother ran from that place. My father stole me away into this country. How do I tell my lover that I do not have a country? So it is. Is it like that? Is it like I run for my friends who are my only home? Like Ryan who holds my wild and fistfuls? Like cackling wild with Michelle over crooked wigs? Like Miss Taji's 2 a.m. serenades? Like Eddie who's got my funeral plans? Oh, beloved, they are my only country. I'll run away as soon as they leave town because that is how it all happens or that this city is always a room with a bed. The man I love most fled my body, made a consulate of my mouth. My papers snagged in his teeth, his papers held on my lips. Like the last morning I saw him, he hugged me. We should hang out again, never did. So I don't keep anything in my room, just the bed and suitcases. You find home, then you run. So then, then you find home, then you run. Then you run, then you run, then you run, then you run on, then you. Rescue the dog. <laughs> <laughs> so we need to update that bio. 
Um, <laughs> that's my bookmark, and I also have some frantic notes here. I'm very nervous about today. Um, but yes, I'll read my essay all about home, uh, chasing home, uh, trying to figure out home, um, chasing my parents after they migrated back to Ecuador and everything that happened in between. It's a late July summer morning, one of those humid mornings you feel on your skin when even noise seems to carry heat. In our apartment, David and I pick up our binder, a two-year curated collection of our time together, serving as proof of our legitimacy as husband and wife. We have rehearsed our story and memorized senseless details about our lives, phone numbers, and past addresses, social security numbers, and dates. Once in the car, I quiz David on my old address. He gets the first one wrong. My anxiety is intensified by the day's heat and the air conditioner, though blowing at high speed offers no relief. It's 2007 E65 Street, David, Mill Basin, remember? He doesn't remember the address, but I know he remembers the stories behind the pictures. I have shown him of the 14 years I lived in Mill Basin with my family. My older sister hugging my dad in front of our Christmas tree. Me as a teen with overplucked eyebrows and side bangs. <laughs> my sister holding our pet rabbit against her chest, smiling big. Pictures of us around birthday cakes and mom's best meal decorating the table. Always the four of us, always home. In 1998, we left our first home in Ecuador, and I was eight years old. My sister, Mia, just a year older. My mom, 41. We came to reunite with my father in Brooklyn. He had left the year before us and soon realized he could not build home without his girls. He sent for us, and we reunited. After six months, our tourist visa expired, and just like that, we became undocumented. Though we began our lives, our new lives, in the United States, my family did not lose hope of going back to Ecuador. Our hearts were still in the home my father had bought for my mother when they married in the 1980s. Our hearts remained in the rooms we had left behind with toys in our twin beds. And in the front yard, adorned with roses and avocado and orange trees that gave all year round. Our hearts clung onto the memory of relatives who called to ask the same question, and when will you all come back? We knew there would be a time when we would return. This was a simple idea and a mutual understanding among our family for a long time. Whenever life got difficult for us with an unfair landlord, rumors of more frequent ice raids, or when we just felt homesick, we would always say, one day we'll go back home. And things got complicated during my egocentric teen years. At 15, I started to reproach my father for bringing us to this country without a plan. His only response was that he wanted to give us a better life. But the answer never satisfied me. Living undocumented was a better life. When I failed to get into college, despite decent grades, I blamed him. When I couldn't find jobs I did not have because I did not have a social security number, I blamed him. The times I couldn't travel, I blamed him. The car I couldn't drive, I blamed him. I aimed all my undocumented emotional bullets at my father. Because I could not hurt this country, I hurt him. And once I grow older, I would eventually come to regret the pain I caused him. Life often teaches children the hard way to venerate the struggles they once criticized their parents for. Unfortunately, my father would not be beside me when I came to such a realization. In 2015, at 67 years old, and after 12 years of working at Penn Manufacturing Factory, my father decided it was time to go home. Savior, 
the limbs echoed against the current of bodies. Savior, the limbs echoed against the lapping goodbyes. Forwards and backwards sway the blue seats beneath the flickering lights, soft yellow halo. Savior, the limbs scratched against two small persimmons, each to fill an hour, soft, bruised flesh, like soft, bruised body, lying, releasing limbs into the horizon beneath the flickering of the void. The second one is called, You Insist on My Native Tongue. You insist on my native tongue, and I think of fishmen and its facetious echo as it roll off my tongue. A facade of an ocean growing alongside my father's picket fence. I think of survival. I think of the necessity to be near water. And with it, the many faces breaking through the viscous maze of back and knee, undulating, waiting to be called. I think of their voices struggling for clarity, a codex stolen for joy, grief, and family. I think of my younger self at three, blue dress, stone steps, more promises of last picture before we go. I think of families sleeping on small boats, swaying to the ticking engine. I think about the shortage of air. I think about the, missed faces, the missing faces until I expand into silence. I think about the chur my throat makes when it marks a blunder in my voice. I'm sorry, my parents don't speak English. I think about the flakes of rice paper, sharp and brittle, but softened by water. I think about my mother's hands weaving grief into each of her recipes to blanch our sins of leaving a country. I think about my face, and I think about the bitterness of not looking Hi, everybody. <clears throat> um, do we have any folks from the Bronx here? <gasps> okay, one person. Well, thank no, you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for coming. <laughs> okay, two. <laughs> Um, this is a long way from the Bronx. I know that Bronx people don't come to Brooklyn, so that's, that's, <laughs> thank you for being loyal. Um, hi everybody, um, I'm Dangeli, I grew up in the Bronx. Um, it meant a lot to me to write this piece. Um, it was the first time that I wrote about my actual immigration story. Um, you know, I feel like, I feel like we find ways to like hide certain details. Um, and I think this was the first time that I was very authentic with it. So, um, just feel me. Very grateful of being here, um, and I hope that you enjoy half of this piece. In the thick of survival, mommy and I loosen the grips on our country, tucking away our hopes for return anytime soon. Mommy took English classes at Bronx Community College, and I focus on unrolling my R, burying a Cibao in a casket of proper spanish. Mommy and Tia Tina iron, I'm sorry, Mommy and Tia Tina iron the casket of, Mommy and Tia Tina iron the countryside out of my tongue, making sure I no longer replace my R's with I's like campesinos on the island did. Porque became porque. And native Dominican words like guagua became a moose. With time, my Spanish underwent yet another transformation when I gained enough courage to speak more English. By the end of high school, I was more Dominican in York more Dominican-American than I could bring myself to admit. I stopped watching Dominican TV channels and telenovelas and watched Disney Channel and rom-coms instead. Vanessa, my best, my best friend, and I used to come home from school and sing karaoke to pop and alternative rock songs until our, song, until our voices were hoarse. I thought that by forcing myself to like white music, I could become more American. The closer to whiteness I felt, the more I thought it, the more the closer to whiteness I felt, the less I thought it mattered that I was undocumented. 
naively, I thought that legislators would one day hear about my assimilation and affirm, you're a real American and you deserve legal status. However, being undocumented and knowing I would not return home anytime soon taught me to appreciate the limited ways that New York offered me access to my native country. New York, home to the largest Dominican population outside of the island, was special for many reasons. It boasted a small movie theater on the corner of 181st and Broadway that showcased Dominican movies. Whenever we went to see a screening, Mommy and I experienced a kind of togetherness and a sense of normalcy and belonging that we had only experienced back on the island. On weekends, Mommy treated me to a bichona con dulce, a Dominican dessert often cooked during Lent, that a Dominican woman sold out of a small food cart on the corner of 181st and St. Nicholas. We ate authentic Dominican food at a Malecon and Caridad restaurant in uptown Washington Heights. Dining among Dominicans and hearing the cooks yell out orders from somewhere in the kitchen in Cibao slang. Observing as Dominican servers talk with their hands and hearing the clinking of dishes dancing in the air with whatever merengue or bachata songs played from large speakers showered me in comfort and familiarity and eased the pain of nostalgia and longing I felt for my native country. In adulthood, I settled for Dykeman in Inwood, in Inwood, Manhattan, the strip of bars that offered Mommy her first bartending job. During the day, most Dominican, most Dykeman establishments are family restaurants where loud music interrupts any attempt at conversation. But after 10 p.m., restaurants became hip clubs, where DJs played them bow, bachata, merengue, salsa, hip hop. And up, amp, up the, amp up the crowd by shouting, Donde están las mujeres que no tienen marido? <laughs> Over every other song. These clubs are undoubtedly Caribbean, specifically Dominican and Puerto Rican. In Dykeman, I could touch my country by putting my hand on the shoulder of any man swaying his hips to La Tambora. I could smell the salt in the air as if I were driving windows down by the beach in Nagua. With every tempo, aventura throwback, and Antonio Rosario song, I could walk home, I, I could walk to my home across the ocean, heels in hand, and climb into my grandmother's bed in the middle of the night as I used to when I was six years old. For a while, I pretended that this was enough. I mean, I had to. I had already spent most of my childhood and adolescence aching for home and cursing my fate. To ask more of life was to set myself up for disappointment. Mommy and I had waited years for una ley, any legislation that created a path towards legalization. But all we ever got was politicians arguing over our livelihood on the 5 p.m. news. Around 2013, a decade after migrating, an attorney whom I interned for screened me for immigration relief. And by then, things with Bobby had deteriorated. And she determined that my on and off relationship with him made me eligible for special juvenile immigration status. After I had had no contact with him for more than two years and no financial support for more than four, the court determined that Papi had abandoned me, therefore fulfilling the requirement for SIDS. The morning of my college graduation, U.S. Citizen and Immigration Services interviewed me and approved my legal permanent status. And this is how, a week after my 21st birthday, I boarded a plane alone and route to the Dominican Republic more than a decade since the first and only other time I had been on a plane. Once in my seat, I opened my book bag and took out a copy of Questions for Ada by Ijuma Umadunyu and found that bookmark page where I had placed a sticky note and written for the return home years before. I marveled at her words. I will return home to five graves, to ancestors who held me as a baby, telling me who I once was in my former life, never a foreigner, always a daughter of her people. And I relieved the longing I had held tightly in my chest for 12 years. I feel like, I feel like I've, I've read these pieces dozens of times and Nothing gets as close to this feeling of hearing our contributors read um, in person and hearing it from their voices. And so uh, what an honor for us to be here together. Uh, we're still in a pandemic, right? Um, 
So for us to be here reading together, sharing space together, writing together, reading books together, um, I think that's just an honor. So I'm super appreciative that all of you are here today. And I'm gonna share one poem and then read from our editor's note um, just to ground um, us on what the book is about. So this is after, um, yeah. I'm also a little nervous, like Anelia. Um, my family's here, and I have chosen like folks here too. So um, trying to like hold back the cries. Um, it was cancer season, so you know. <laughs> this is like a retro game. <laughs> uh, so this is after. Like gold, a good immigrant doesn't tarnish. Like gold, we are extracted and polished. I shine on a magazine cover. Mommy cleans the same colleges I perform at. Papa Jetty is told to extract the last gold tooth we got in Ecuador. Wearing his new dentures, Papa Jetty can't return to bury his parents. He grinds his teeth at night for 51 years and keeps digging. I'm told to wear this green card across my neck like a gold chain spelling out my name and then and then after we become gold, what do we dig for? As children, we had dirt under our nails from countries we undug after the social security, the numbers, the papers, the status, the job, the dream. Don't our hands hurt? Maybe we don't want to be like gold. Maybe buried deeper somewhere near our elders' feet. Maybe we are tired. Maybe I want to be earth, human. how like loud my mic is but do let me know for the folks in the back great okay thank you um, so this is from the editor's notes um, somewhere we are human is not complete one book cannot encompass the multitudes of migrant experiences but this book is unique in that it was created exclusively by undocumented and formerly undocumented immigrants from the compilation the editing writing and even to the art that is beautifully embroidered um, there's a dandelion on the front cover, and you can actually feel the, tech, the texture. Although the monarch butterfly has become a symbol of migration as an act of survival, we chose the dandelion to symbolize our journeys. Everyone loves butterflies. The same cannot be said of dandelions, which regardless of their beneficial properties are considered, weed, considered weeds. Too often, immigrants are also seen in a negative light. Luckily, dandelion seeds are strong and adaptable. We've all seen the ground, them ground and bloom in the most unlikely places. And like the dandelion seeds, with the odds stacked against us, we immigrants do our best to make new lives and continue existing wherever we land. This is why we organized the collections into three sections, defined by the faces of the immigrant journey, migration, survivor, and new beginnings. A journey not, not unlikely that of the dandelion. Um, we are joined by our phenomenal contributors. These are uh, four individuals out of the 39 that we have, um, essays, poets, visual artists. Uh, for us, it was really important to curate a book that really had is imagine and push our understanding of what immigrants or immigrant stories can look like, seem or appear like. Um, and so we tried to expand the range of the, the different issues that we were we were tackling. So it was not just like immigration and just talk about like papers in one like singular way, but immigration through like the relationships that are, we're building, our connection to climate change, racial justice, uh, our connections to also like our own family and our um, and love making. And so this book it was a two year project. Um, started at the beginning of the pandemic and what an honor it is again to be here with you all and I wanted to open up the space for the contributors to share um, what was the process like for you all to to write those pieces those essays those poems um, because I know you've also submitted other pieces or you had other things in there 
but I noticed that there was a theme that you were pulling at and picking on. Um, so I wanted to know, like, um, what are people expecting in this book from you? Like, what is the essay or the poems that you wrote about? Um, I guess I can go first. Um, I guess I, one, right, I, I did not migrate the way that um, mainstream media um, showcases immigrants to migrate, right? I didn't have a border story. I had no metaphors around the desert. I'm, I'm a poet, right? I write poems. And for the first time, I felt like my story needed to live as an essay um, because I was telling the kind of story that many immigrants that migrate from the Caribbean are scared to tell, which is, you know, migrating through like fake documentation, right? Um, taking on someone's identity at only eight years old um, and a way that is very criminalized um, and not often spoken about. So for me, writing about the story was important because, you know, one, we don't hear it a lot, um, especially from like, you know, black Caribbeans um, who are surrounded by water. And two, because I wanted to explore the relationship that feel, that fall apart when migration um, happens, right? And in this case, it was my relationship with my dad. You know, my dad and I, pre-migration, were very close, you know? Um, daddy's girl, um, and he was not, uh, you know, he was not uh, uh, okay with me migrating. He thought that the U.S that I deserve more than the US and that he could give me everything that I ever wanted in the DR from here. But, you know, he had his own immigration struggle. So a lot of this piece was coming to terms with the story that my dad had before me, um, but also taking ownership of the relationship that we unfortunately had post-migration. Um, and, you know, Sonia was very patient and very tender um, with holding this story for me because even though our stories are ours, they're also our parents. And in the way that we tell our own stories, we're also sharing their story. So I had to come kind of navigate what it means to tell their story in a way that is true to me, but also in a way that honors them in a way, right? Um, and that's not always easy. So I think the, the theme that I, see, that I see in Somewhere We Are Human is this, this balancing of not just our stories, but also our loved ones, you know, our friends, our our family, um, and and what it means to impact everybody around you and be impacted by everybody around you. Our stories are intersectional, right? Um, and it's a domino effect to migrate to this country because we touch people's lives in a way that we never even imagined we would when we were maybe kids or even young adult migrants. Um, so I guess, for me, I think this book just needs authenticity for the first time in my life. Um, and also being like, yo, like, like, you ain't shit, but like, I love you, you know? Um, and like, you're really gonna be mad when you read this, but it's also true, you know? And like, let's talk about it after. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that's, that's what I could, I think that's the overall theme authentic immigrant stories um, that go past whatever we see in the news. Yeah, I think um, in terms of process, it's interesting that I, I, I think it's actually really, really deeply important that like, uh, that when we talk about this collection, we contextualize that it, 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 it is developed and the contributions all occurred during the pandemic at a time when I think immediately the effects of COVID and COVID policy in the US were directly and most violently like present in detention centers and jails uh, and, and, and migrant communities, which often tend to be black and brown communities in the US. And I think that nearness to, to death and its possibility in that moment I think for many of us really activated a sense of nostalgia, right? Like the, the, this longing for the thing that might be home. And I think for so many of us, home actually is often and almost always people. And, and the US is 
fan, like the US as, as, as a country, as a project, is fantastic at deploying a very specific type of white supremacist nostalgia to constantly like organize and make the architecture that ends up killing us. Um, and we seldom talk about the nostalgias that we build that tether us to people, right? That, that sometimes actually when we say, I miss my country, actually what I'm, what I'm saying inside that statement is, I miss the people that raised me, I miss, I miss like the specific mountains, I miss, um, I miss like the terrible smells of like markets. Um, and, and that those things are, are more a country than, than anything countries can organize. And so I think there was something about nostalgia and the kind of uncertain question of what a return to home might be for us during the pandemic that for me really motivated the pieces. There's two pieces in, in, the, in the anthology that I wrote. Um, one is Quinceañera, and the other is you find home, then you run, and I feel like Quinceañera feels like a sort of look back at how it is that I ended up here at Juarez Chihuahua, um, which for a long time was marked as like the deadliest city in the world, or, um, or you know, sort of like came into national spotlight because of the femicides that were largely spurred by NAFTA, and so, um, it's, it's difficult, I think, sometimes to want to express nostalgia for a place that you love, because like, I, I love where I'm from, and sometimes whenever people hear that I'm from Juarez, all I see is like pity. They're like, oh, I'm so sorry, like, you should be dead. Like, wow, you're so brave. Um, <laughs> and, and so I think, I think a really important project for so many of us, and something that I'm finding in the collection, and that I found is, it, is how we become place for one another. Um, how might it be that inside writing and that inside the sharing of writing, inside the act of anthology, right, which is of being beside other people, um, we might make homes with each other in response to the violence of countries. Um, that, that there is a way that we can be for and with each other um, that refuses the violence of the state. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. 
even provides. It's this chance to connect. And when you're reading these stories, I, or at least for me, when I'm reading these stories, I realize that one of the themes that real that comes to me is um, persevere, perseverance. Persevere through your stories. Your stories matter because you matter, you know? And, and you definitely should share your story. And in sharing your story, you're celebrating life among its challenges. And I think that's really, really amazing. where I was when I was writing this story. Um, and I am taken back to 2020 schools closing. Um, and I remember not loving the writing process because after a long day of remote teaching, the last thing I wanted to do was reconnect with my childhood trauma. I <laughs> wanted to watch Love and Hip Hop and just to now, like I did not want to think or feel, but I would be sitting at my dining room table in front of the laptop writing away and like they would be walking by and I'm crying. And um, also like confronting this big question that our family is now having, which is why did our parents leave? And why, why did we allow them? And um, we hear from people, you know, when you were here, why did you go back, right? And um, how did you leave your children? And I think my mom battled a lot of that guilt and also my father. And so I was thinking about how do I honor those voices, right? Um, how do I go back to that time? And I talk about it here, like my sister and I sitting in front of a computer with my dad, he's holding his passport and we're booking his flight. Knowing that if he went back home, us being undocumented, we weren't gonna be able to go back and see him um, or my mom and we just took that decision, we made that decision, right? So writing this allowed me to reconnect with a lot of the answers and a lot of the things that happened. A lot of it had to do with Trump. A lot of it had to do with ice cream. A lot of it had to do with things that we knew were coming and we couldn't name and we're seeing it now. And we sometimes call home and we're like, thank God you're not here. We wouldn't want you here. Even though the only thing that I want sometimes is to have them here. So I'm thankful for this opportunity to be able to write this. And also, I felt really happy to be able to write about getting my papers and going back home and how that felt very empty. And how like, I don't even remember what happened. Um, and I don't even know where the pictures went <laughs> when that happened or the videos. Um, so it wasn't, it, it's not the end, right? And how complex it is to be undocumented and then adjust your status and then go back home to find that you miss home. And I remember talking to Sherman, <laughs> my dear co-teacher, and I told her, you know, like, when I was in Ecuador, I missed home. She was like, wait, but you were home. I was like, home here. And then it all got complicated, right? So thinking about the different homes that we have in people and places and imaginations. And so I'm happy that they exist here and I'm happy that we get to have this and bring it into the classroom. I'm not in the classroom anymore, but I'm happy that all the many teachers that are here can maybe bring it to their students um, and have them tell their stories because I, I think there are so many stories that are untold um, that need to be told. So I'm, I can't wait to leave them in the classroom. Thank you. Once you read the copy that you bought or purchased or you know got here in the front, uh, you'll witness a range of stories that are just like decentering the United States Empire, right? Like when it's centering like this heart, 
uh, oftentimes migrant folks, migrant artists are asked to just like stick to a specific narrative. Um, but you'll see like there's joy, there's heartbreak, there's messiness, there's a lot of in inner um, like inner reflection that happens and our own connection to um, to this empire in a way that um, doesn't dehumanize us or doesn't put in a position of has, us having to advocate for ourselves and our communities and talking points. Like you see like lived experience, people's like their breathing, their stories. And for me, it's like really making sure that that we get across the message that migrant folks, undocumented folks, existed before the migration, are existing during the migration, and that their stories are gonna continue on beyond migration. Like that is not just like one focal point, like we have, we have multifaceted folks, There's so many things. We, ha we have rich lives that we live, not because of like, um, of like our an immigration status, but because we have nicknames and we have family members, we have loved ones that we can, you know, like connect with. And I think that uh, many of the pieces do that. There's so many pieces that also are in conversation with each other, might contradict each other, uh, might bring up questions uh, for yourself about your own connection to this to this empire, to this country. Um, we wanted to make some room to take questions from the audience. Um, I think it is, again, phenomenal to uplift artists and culture workers because they help us imagine and envision the world that we want, especially, you know, with all the shit that went down on Friday and all the other rulings that have happened even before that regarding like border stuff, um, you know, so many things. Um, but yeah, we wanted to take some questions from the audience. This is your moment to ask the contributors um, questions that you may have before you dive into the book. Questions or comments or <laughs> praises, we welcome that too. Just gonna repeat the question out loud. Um, did you find yourself writing for that tiny you, your tiny self, and what was that process like? I can definitely share on that. Um, she's always in the back of my mind, specifically like teenager Amelia, because she was reckless um, and kind of mean, <laughs> uh, especially to her parents, um, but I write to her because it took me a while to forgive that behavior. Um, I would always tell my dad or my mom, like, I don't wanna be here, why'd you bring me here? Um, and I, growing up, I felt like I needed to like ask for a lot of forgiveness, and I did, because that wasn't very nice, but I understand where it was coming from now, and I understand it after being in the classroom. I understand it when I would see a young person have a bad day. And it was never about the book we were reading or the lesson that was going on. It was really about what was happening with themselves and at home and um, having to deal with the snow for the first time, right? And, and having to like commute to school and like have to do all these things when maybe things were happening to them related to immigration and I felt connected to them. And so I, through my students and what they've been through, um, I 
I was able to forgive myself. Um, and I, I wouldn't say forgive, I would say understand. I think um, for me, that relationship to that younger version of myself, I, I definitely like in Quinceañera, which is one of the pieces that's in here, I actually kept thinking about what it means to write as that young person. Um, because I, I some, especially like as I get older and, the, and, and as I feel like a sort of, like a hardening relationship to this, to this place, to this country, right? Like a sort of like, damn, like, I'm like, this is it. This is the place that I know best. Oh, that's sad. Um, um, I think about like how courageous that that small version of myself was, and how like uh, even like I think about like my teenage self that was also like pretty reckless and like verga. Um, like I I think there's something really potent about like the courage and like political imagination that that younger that our younger selves have that I think sometimes feels like the best place to write from because that older self then gets to read it and be like, what am I scared of? Like, what am I afraid of if that young version of myself already risked everything? Like I think about like the nine year old version of myself that when my dad was like, do you want to get inside the, this truck seat and I'm going to stuff it with blankets and then don't make a sound. We're going to cross a bridge in this truck. Yeah? And you know, you're a kid so you're like, oh work, yeah, I'll, just, I'll do whatever. Um, <laughs> Um, and I think there's something really, I think there's something really like powerful about that younger version of yourself. And I, I, I wonder often actually about the inverse relationship, which is how do you smuggle that young version of yourself into the future that they, they got to live through? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I forgot the question. Yeah. <laughs> um, when you were, those pieces where you writing for that tiny self, Um, well, definitely. Um, I mean, the, the, my piece starts with when I was four years old, um, and it talks about like my dad migrating, eventually my mom, and then myself. Um, you know, I think, at least for me, growing up in this country, there was a lot of forgetting that I had to do in order to survive with whatever I had here. Um, you know, I think that first year after migration is probably the hardest, especially for a kid where you're like, you kind of don't understand why things have to be different. Um, and you're trying to make sense of it all. Um, and while writing this piece, I knew where I wanted to start. Um, but while writing, I started remembering things that I had kept myself from thinking about for years. I think it was just too painful to think about the beginnings, right, of like, you know, my life was already in a trajectory to migrate, even when, I mean, even when I couldn't really understand or make any decisions on the world. The first memory that I have is my dad leaving um, when I was four. And I remember so vividly that my mom sometimes is very shocked that I remember all the details. And I think, when you think psychologically, it might be because it was the first traumatic event. Um, <laughs> right? So, like, it was very important to me to, like, honor her, right? And, like, put whatever memory she had, little Dangeli, baby Dangeli, on paper. So that, like, grown me, right? Green card me, citizenship me could finally say, like, it's okay now. Like, we are safe here, um, and I got you. Uh, so the process for me was, I cried a lot. Like, remembering stuff like that isn't fun. Like, it's, it sounds beautiful on paper, but when you're, you're just, you know, you're out there, you know, like, my partner will come home, and I'm like, please don't look at me, like, go straight to the room. Like, my eyes are puffy from crying. Like, I'm, you know, like, it was like, it was such an intimate moment that like, the homework and the process is parenting yourself. I think that's, that's what it comes down to. So it's taking the time to face yourself and say like, cry, because you couldn't cry then. Um, 
and now like remind yourself that you're okay. Now you're writing for um, someone we are human, like we could. Um, but also we're not. So, you know, you know, but like we made it, you know, like you're not there anymore. Um, so I think if, if, if we have, you know, migrants in the room who like still have a lot of these memories, I think a lot of the healing that I have done in the past two years and a lot of the healing that I have to do during the pandemic was coming to terms with all the things that happened in the past so that I could understand how I came to be. And then nurturing every single baby, child, toddler, teen, asshole teen, um, that jelly that I have been. Um, and one day you kind of wake up and you're like, shit, it's still painful, but now it's okay. out the question by saying um, for me on the hand I was just as one of the editors I was imagining all of us like our tiny selves um, so I have like, this affinity to like my ten, tiny young self to make sure that she's okay that um, that she can imagine and that she can play I think as being like the oldest child my grand having to translate for my parents and like, figure out like how to talk to Time Warner you know, like, you're like, <laughs> how do you translate things into Spanish? You know, like, that, you know, like, no sabo, like, that's real. <laughs> I, and I feel that um, it just, and there's, like, like now research and studies and conversations about, like, this, this fast adultness, growing upness, like, it's, like, pushed on children, um, first generation and migrant children. Um, and so, I tried to allow myself to play throughout this like anthology to like make sure that I was like in conversations and texting people and also you know like this country did like its number on me and making me question my own artistry making me question if I was like good enough to edit you know like and, and like why this publisher and um, there were so many things that I was like trying to balance and um, I think throughout the whole time, I was like, tiny selves, like tiny people, like, you know, all of our folks, and just like looking through everybody's names and remembering, um, these are folks that like, that we all come across each other, whether it was in movement organizing, artistry, like social media, like we, we've overlapped in ways that I feel that oftentimes, um, it is a race about migrant artists, like we are part of community and we've been building with each other, we've known each other's work, and so, this was an opportunity to work and play in this like very hard and like um, emotional way and also like a, a way of, of healing. Um, so this was like definitely like my first time editing something of this magnitude, um, but not my first time being in community 
and looking out for each other and making sure that in our conversation with publisher, like we were advocating, that we were paying, that we were making sure like our front cover was done by a migrant person, an undocumented person, um, that a multitude of voices were included. And so um, I'm very proud of, of I'm very grateful for my tiny self showing up these past two years to hold my hand through this process because adult me, like, you know, like, I'm 33 now, like, you know, my birthday was like a week ago, and I'm still, like, doubting my creative process, and, um, but what a strength that I was able to, you know, to, to be a part of with this, like, collective group of folks who are just brilliant amazing, very stylish, you know, um, who didn't, I'm sure they curse us out every time we send that edit, you know, that Google Doc, I was like, oh my God, they're not going to talk to us again. Um, but ultimately, this this is a book of love, like this is a book of like, of complicatedness, and we're so excited that you get to read it and you have access to it. Um, and I want to leave with like one last question for the folks here, like, um, what are ways that we can approach you and supporting your work? What are things that you're working on? Or anything you want to shout out about yourselves? Um, yeah, this is your room to like, let's hype each other up. Like we have to root it for each other. You can drop your Venmo, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm applause for Venmo. <laughs> girl, but not really, early 20s, I guess, um, young woman, um, you can purchase my poetry collection, it was self-published, I always said that I wasn't really ready to um, go to a publisher, um, and that I wanted to create something that I could control in every aspect, so I published my first book, um, so if you want to talk, if you want to read about my shitty exes, that's the place, <laughs> that's the place to do it. Um, yeah, I'm just, you know, I'm a poet, so I be out here doing stuff, so if you want to follow me, um, my Instagram is very long, but you can just look up my name, then Jenny, and I should pop up. Um, and, um, yeah, just projects coming up, just stay tuned, and if you are interested in, um, beginning to, like, write poetry, spoken word, perform, um, spoken word, um, hit up the DMs, I'm here, um. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how to shout myself. Now I'm like man nervous. <laughs> All of a sudden I'm so conscious. Um, yeah, I think that's that's it. Um, yeah, in the spirit of messiness, um, <laughs> you can find me on Grindr. I'm also on Turn on your, turn on your location. <laughs> okay. Oh, sniffies. Um, and uh, but yeah, my Instagram is uh, at the Jesusia T G J S um, at the Jesusia. Um, I'm also um, in October through November. Um, so I wrote a solo show called Undocuments, which is largely autobiographical. Um, uh, I have a six week run uh, at the LA Theater Center in Los Angeles. So if you have West Coast people, um, yeah. So it'll be there October 12th through November 20th. Um, and then I'm mostly based in Providence, so if you're ever out there, there's very little to do. Say hi. Again, <laughs> <laughs> I'm on Grindr, Growlers. <laughs> um, but yeah, super happy to talk about process, super happy to talk about whatever. Um, yeah, I never refuse a friend, so yeah, I'm around. <laughs> Photoshop, so I'm just making collages. <laughs> I'm not sure where it's going, but I am sharing my process, like these drafts that I have on my Instagram, which is um, at Jess T. Lee, so J U S T dot L E. Um, and yeah, that's it. And otherwise, I'm just 
you know, pursuing that acting career. So I guess it's time to vibe. Send all the good vibes. Um, my Instagram profile is not reliable. I just go missing sometimes. I delete it like five times a year. Um, then come back with like essays um, as captions. So it's not right. But if you find me, it's Amelia Fialo. Um, and a way that you can support me is just yeah. I think. Good energy is powerful. I firmly believe in it. Um, and then I am also part of a beautiful organization in schools. We ensure that our undocumented students and families um, have safer and more inclusive classrooms all across New York City public schools. I would rather you go there and check us out and support our work at in schools. Um, our beautiful team is here. I love them. They have given me my life back as an educator. Um, and then another request would be definitely support your teachers. If you have a teacher in your life, please leave them alone. <laughs> they are tired. They are on summer break. They don't want to talk about your children. <laughs> they don't want to talk about lesson planning. They don't want to look at supplies. Don't just leave them alone. Maybe give them like a Starbucks card or give them money. Right? Support their uh, vacation pictures on Instagram. But <laughs> definitely um, show a lot of love for educators. I they run the world. I love them so much. Um, so that's what I would say. Leave them alone, but also pay them. <laughs> uh, thank you everyone. Somewhere We Are Human is going to be on tour throughout the rest of the year. So if you have folks in California, Las Vegas, Philadelphia, Chicago, and Texas, let us know so we can send you the, the details of our events coming up. Um, continue supporting our contributors. Uh, Continue supporting community folks on the ground, organizing, like, you know, like, uh, both our policy folks, both of our organizers, and also our artists and cultural workers, like, specifically artists of color, black, brown, indigenous folks, uh, queer, trans, non-binary folks, like, are in need of your support right now. Like, I'm so glad that we're here holding space. Um, it is a hard time. Um, I'm still processing that but I think that it does require all of us to show up for each other in ways that find that, that feel good for you. So whether it's that, you know, donating to your local abortion funds or your local reproductive justice spaces um, or supporting and uplifting, you know, brown, black, indigenous, like queer, trans artists, like here are folks that you can support. You know, we need our artists and our cultural workers. We need our imaginations um, and we need all of us alive and thriving ecosystem so thank you all for coming thank you to this venue is amazing I haven't been here um, thank you books are magic for having us and making space for us uh, the contributors uh, will be signing uh, in that table in the back uh, bathrooms are in the back I know and some folks were holding it um, I've been holding it um, but thank you again thank you so much thank you everyone thank you to our loved ones our friends and our and our families who are here thank you like snappy photos but you probably caught us like this or like you know so like we're gonna give you two seconds to take out your phone take a picture of us and we're gonna pose all right so if you want to scooch up or you know it's just like we're gonna look so we're still a little <laughs> all right one for the people one two three Thank you everyone, thank you so much, thank you very much.